Hello, I see people are streaming in still. I wanted to welcome you, welcome you all to the um, second uh, class of STEG's virtual course on key concepts in macro development. Um, this is course is offered, um, of course, as you know, free um, from STEG's uh, CEPR program, which is supported by the United uh, Kingdom's uh, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Uh, we're thankful uh, for them for their uh, support. Um, uh, last week, uh, Richard Rogerson gave the introductory lecture. If you uh, missed that, um, the, both the lecture slides and um, the talk are available on our website uh, via YouTube. Um, today, we're very thrilled to have Julieta Caunedo, who's going to talk about uh, development and uh, in income accounting. Um, Julieta has uh, said, for those who are um, uh, panelists, uh, Julieta has said uh, you can you know, interrupt her with questions. That's fine, just as you would in an ordinary class. Um, she may, you know, depending on how many we have, she may not be able to answer all, all of them. She might to continue with the, the lecture uh, just as a normal class would be. Um, but otherwise, if you're not answering, asking a question, please mute. Um, for those who are joining as participants, uh, you can type questions into the Q&A. You can vote them up. Uh, Doug Gollin uh, and I um, will be answering those in the Q&A. Uh, there will also be a, um, a TA session for this lecture. Um, and I actually don't know the timing on that. Julieta, do you know the timing for that or Mandy? Yes, so it's going to be on Monday, the same time. Um, okay. And I'll explain in a bit what is that session going to be about. OK. Um, and um, uh, Julieta will leave a little bit of time at the end uh, for answering questions uh, as well. And I think that's it. Um, well, let me thank, I should, I, no, I should, <laughs> uh, let me do a couple other things. One is um, um, lectures, notes for this lecture are also available uh, online and this will be available uh, on YouTube as well uh, following the lecture. Um, let me also thank uh, Mandy Chan and Kirsty um, McNeil at CEPR for helping organize this as well. Okay, Julieta, go ahead. All right, thanks, uh, uh, Dag and, and and Richard and Joe for for asking me to to this le lecture. I'm thrilled to see that there's so much interest in the field, and I'm hoping that um, STEC will become a home for many students that are thinking about these issues. Um, and I would like to have some sort of references of people that are working in, in similar issues and thinking about this. Um, so welcome to hopefully your intellectual home. Um, what I wanna do today is to uh, talk about an important issue, which is development accounting. So let me just share my screen. So this is a, your second lecture uh, for the virtual macro development course. This is gonna be a course on, on income accounting. Um, a few organizational issues is that uh, Raul Morales, who's a fifth year student at Cornell, he's gonna be uh, doing a TA section on Monday. Uh, you will see that a lot of what I'm gonna do today is gonna be measurement and it will require data analysis. Um, so I generated a small repository that you can access and you will find the link through the slide deck and also uh, through the uh, stack web page where you can see there is minimal code that will allow you to do a lot of the work that I'm going to describe today and hopefully play around with the data. So what Raul is going to do on Monday is work, work with you to make sure that you have questions about it, if you have questions about it. Um, he will be able to answer those for you, okay? So um, without further ado, let me just uh, dig in into the issue of the, today's lecture. So the first thing to, to, that you should be asking yourself is, you know, what is income accounting? So as, as Richard mentioned at the beginning of, of his introductory class last week, he said, you know, the main question for macro development is the, the you know, the observation that there are poor and rich countries in the world and those differences are persistent. And we wanna understand why, okay? 
But to be able to understand why, we need to be able to, un, you know, to understand the sources of those income disparities. So income accounting is gonna have a particular approach to answering that question. So, you know, we wanna know if the reason why poor and richer countries are different, is it because richer countries use more labor or because they have better educated workers or because they have more physical capital or the capital that they use is different altogether. Or even more important, is it because they have similar you know, factors, workers and physical capital, but then somehow they manage to do better use of those inputs, okay? So what income accounting refers to is the approach to answering those questions. So what we are gonna do in income accounting is to measure to the best possible each of these ingredients. And then we're gonna uh, measure also the relative contributions of each of these ingredients. So for example, it might be that, and this is not gonna be true in the data, just so you know, but it might be that there are large differences in physical capital, but physical capital contributes very little to differences in income across countries. So then those differences are not gonna be very important in explaining uh, why Malawi is poor and the US is rich, okay? Now, spoiler alert here, I'm gonna start from the end. I'm gonna tell you what we know so far or what seems to be the consensus in the literature. The current consensus is that disparities in things that we can directly measure, like capital and labor, account for at most 50% of the difference in income per capita. So there is still a lot that, uh, you know, that we can't directly measure. We have some ideas of what is generating that additional 50%. Um, but from a pure accounting sense, capital and labor only account for about half of the difference that we see. Now, there is an issue with interpreting this finding in the sense that the fact that, you know, how we use those inputs is accounting for 50% of the differences, you know, at the very least, um, may fit back into input accumulation, right? So um, it is important to say that the capital and labor or the capital and labor that we see in an economy is not exogenous to that economy. How much you invest in Argentina depends on the environment of the economy in Argentina, okay? And the links to the world, et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, as you will see in the rest of this course, of the macro development course, we are gonna, there's gonna be, you know, very important scholars explaining, um, you know, the role of this better use of inputs and how we think about that, particularly the role of misallocation and the role of frictions. But that's gonna come later in the, in, the, in the course. Today, I will have very little to say about this, okay? There is another issue, which is the issue of heterogeneity. Um, you know, how much capital and labor account for in the aggregate may not be the same across sectors or across firms, okay? So I'll talk a little bit about that today. And then there is a final question, which is, are we doing the best we can in measures, measure inputs um, properly? And the biggest challenge in doing this, when you think of data across countries, is to do it in a harmonized way, okay? So I'll get to these issues as we move through, through the course. So let me just tell you what's gonna be uh, the plan for today. I'm gonna give you the very basics of this. I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time on this um, because it, it is important. The first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a framework to think about the data. And in general, I think when we're gonna go and get our hands dirty with data, it's useful to have a framework because that's an organizing um, path that you can use to put order on how you look at the data, okay? We're not just gonna run a million random regressions and come up with something. We want structure. And that's what the framework is gonna do. And then I'm gonna get very detailed 
on the data that we have available, what we can measure, what we know um, that are important margins that we should explore further. And I think what, it, what is important about this is that, you know, I think the first, any of you that have a, an ECOIN major have had some interaction with, with accounting, typically national accounts. Okay, that would be the first or second class in a standard intro to macro or intermediate macro course. And I don't know about you, but I remember the first time I see this, most likely I was rolling my eyes thinking, this is not very, you know, this is not fun. This is, what are we doing? It turns out that it's actually quite important. Okay, and I don't know, perhaps I've been thinking too much about this in the last couple of weeks, uh, but I think it's critical to our understanding of the development process, okay? So we need to get dirty with the data somehow. Uh, then I'm gonna discuss what the main findings of the literature are and different approach, approaches to think about um, um, the accounting per se. And then I'm gonna just uh, bring up some issues that I think are important, but mostly as a roadmap to think about open questions that I think are gonna be important if, if you guys are, guys are interested in the field and you shouldn't take this as a, as a uh, you know, as a roadmap of what people think is interesting. This is mostly what Julieta think it's interesting, okay? Um, so I'll, I'll get to the details as I, as I go along into the selected issues. Now, before I get into uh, the framework, are there questions? So let me get on. Okay, so the framework that we're gonna use to think about income accounting is the one, the neoclassical framework, okay? So we're gonna think of a, a production technology that is neoclassical where output is produced with physical capital K, each or human capital, so the measure of quality adjusted uh, labor force. So basically we wanna somehow measure that guys that finish college um, are different than people that do not um, go to school altogether. Alpha is gonna be the capital share. And this technology is gonna be neo neoclassical because we're gonna assume constant returns to scale. Okay, that's why the, the share on labor is gonna be one minus alpha. And we're also gonna assume Higgs neutral technology. That's gonna be A, and that's gonna be our measure of total factor productivity. So, so far, I've been talking about this idea of the efficiency with which we use inputs. Through the lens of the model, that's gonna be this total factor productivity, this A, okay? Now, if I give you this, one temptation is to say, oh, this is nice. This is log linear, right? So I can take logs on this. If I truly believe that the production technologies out there um, have this particular feature that are, that are called Douglas, then I can take logs and then I just get the linear regression, a, a linear regression of sorts, right? So I have output, I have capital, I have measures of labor input, and then this A that I cannot really measure, this you know, concept of deficiency with which you use factors, is gonna be an error, okay? Now, there, there are uh, many reasons why this is a bad idea, okay? So first, for these, these, um, these estimates to give you unbiased estimators of what, the, what these, uh, uh, you know, factor shares are and the contribution of these, of these, each of these elements, you need a orthogonality condition between TFP and input. And that's very unlikely. This is a story, this is what I was saying before, right? If uh, it is unlikely that if you live in an economy where inputs are not very well used, I'm gonna invest a lot in that economy. Say I'm gonna accumulate capital in that economy, okay? So the orthogonality between the errors and the, and the uh, regressors here is likely to be violated. But more important, there is a huge literature that um, in, in industrial organization that speaks about the challenges of estimating a production function, let alone a production function in the aggregate. 
So the income accounting um, approach is gonna take this production, neoclassical production technology seriously, and it's gonna try to measure to the best possible each of these ingredients, okay? And taking this structural restriction, which is the shape of the production technology, we're gonna try to measure what the role of each of these components is, okay? So as I said, remember um, what things are observable. So we observe, we observe output, GDP, we observe physical capital, and we observe somehow human capital. We'll talk about whether this is really observable or not and what are we missing. But the idea is that we need some sort of way to figure out what this object is, which is a residual. Okay? Okay. Now, again, another temptation is to say, okay, I can measure K, I can measure H, I can measure Y, let me compute, and I, I know what the alpha is. And I'll, I'll, it's okay if you don't know right now uh, what the alpha is. I'll, I'll tell you how we measure this. Um, and then you can say, okay, let me count for the, the role of capital in this, in, this, uh, in this equation, okay? Now, the problem is that there are important uh, feedback effects between TFP and investment, okay? And that we know from the insight of the one sector growth model. Okay. Again, this is something that um, uh, we can get to. If you have questions about the details of the one sector growth model, I'll be happy to take them either at the end of the class or, or online. And even Raul can, can go through some of these details uh, on Monday. Okay. Now, there is a, an important takeaway from the one sector growth model, which is that differences in TFP are going to induce differences in capital. So if I just say, okay, how much of the variation in output is explained by capital? And I don't take into account the fact that some of the variation that I, can, that I see in capital is coming from TFP, then I'm, gonna, I'm just not gonna get the right answer, right? But what is important from the wax or growth model is that we know that the capital output ratio is actually independent of TFP in steady state. What is a steady state? Steady state is an allocation where output, uh, capital, output and capital are constant, okay? Now, the Euler equation of a standard growth sector, uh, one sector growth model, so if you, um, the Euler equation is basically the equation that tells me what the optimal accumulation of capital is along the equilibrium path of the economy, okay? He's saying that if I invest one unit in capital today, I should get the expected return on capital tomorrow, okay? Now that's the question that you have in the bottom. And it just says um, that, the, this, sorry, that the capital output ratio or the inverse of the capital output ratio, which is the object that you have here, okay? is gonna be a function in state state. So this is the, the Euler equation in state state, the capital output ratio is gonna be a function of parameters. So it's gonna be constant and independent of TFP. What are those parameters? Well, the parameters are the depreciation rate for capital, okay? So, you know, if I have a car, I need to go to the garage every year for maintenance, etc. All that because, you know, using the car it's gonna make it break more often. That's a depreciation rate, okay? In the concept of a neoclassical model, this is just a, this is just a, a number, okay? And then a discount factor, which is gonna, in state state, in a one sector gross model, it's gonna give you a measure of the impatience of the agents, okay? How much do I value consuming today versus consuming tomorrow, okay? And that's why the return to capital, which is, um, the good that allows me to transfer consumption today to consumption tomorrow is gonna depend on how impatient I am, okay? But the point is that in a standard neoclassical world, 
in, in the world of the one sector growth model, this object in steady state is a constant. Okay? So here, the one sector growth model is giving us a lot of structure on how to look at the data and how to do the accounting. It's saying, look, look, look. Yes, you know that K is a function um, of A, but honestly, if you just look at capital output ratios, then you're gonna kill that relationship. So let's do that, okay? So how do we do that? Well, we're gonna rewrite our neoclassical production function like this. So the neoclassical production function was this object here. Oh, sorry, I use L, I should use H. Okay, so divide by y over y to the alpha. And I can collect that term here. Okay, and now I can solve for y. So if you solve for y, you're gonna end up with this. Okay, so I basically have the same, the same production technology that you had before, just rewritten in terms of the capital output ratio. Okay, and that's if I further divide by the headcount of the number of workers in the economy, that's L. If I divide by the number of workers, I end up with the equation that I'm gonna be using for accounting throughout. What this equation says is that the amount of income per worker in an economy is gonna be a function of, you know, the efficiency of usage of factors, some modified function of that, the capital output ratio, okay? And my measure of human capital, okay? You can write this in logs if that helps the accounting, and I'll show you that given, depending on what measure of the accounting you're gonna use, this, this might be useful. Um, but for now, this is the equation that we're gonna be using throughout. Our accounting is gonna decompose output per worker into capital output ratios, modified by a factor share of capital and a measure of human capital. Whatever is not accounted by the capital, labor, capital output ratio and human capital is gonna be accrued to the efficiency of usage of factors, TFP. Okay? Are there questions about this? Good, so we can move on. Okay, so let me remind you uh, that the, the question that we are asked after is how much of the variation in income per, per worker is accounted for variation in capital output ratios, human capital, and the residual? Okay, so I basically narrow down the question, the, the income accounting question. With that, I'm ready to go and tell you how we're going to measure these uh, elements. Okay. The good news of living in 2021 and not in the second half of the, of the 20th, 20th century is that a lot of work has been done uh, to help us measure this object, okay? The good news for you guys, they're gonna be writing the next generation of, of, res of uh, you know, research on this topic is that not everything is done. So there's still questions. Okay, so, um, as Richard mentioned last week, kind of the, the go-to measure uh, for macro development is the, the, the Penguar tables, okay? This was a data set that was created in the 60s by, uh, to measure uh, differences in living standards, okay? Now, there is a question of, you know, whether we want to measure living standards or we want to measure productive capacity. And since 
basically the productive capacity of an economy. And since version 8.0 of the pen word table, which is right now run by the, uh, uh, by the University of Groninger and the Groninger Center for Growth, um, there have been substantial changes that are gonna allow you to, to measure productive capacity using the pen word tables, okay? Now my two cents here before we even get into the data is that in general, you should be very careful uh, on how you set the data and record the vintages that you're using, because there are, this data is in constant um, um, change. People are, you know, the the the, um, uh, the group that is putting together this data is working really hard to make as many improvements to the data as possible. So that means that the change is changing, the data change. Now, what I did for this course is I generated a repository, a Git have repository. For those of you that are not familiar with, with Git, um, you can pretty much just link on the, on the slides. It's gonna take you to a web page where you can download all the material that is relevant for these things. You don't need to work in that environment. Um, you will need to have access to a software uh, like Stata to be able to run the code that you have there. But if you don't want to, the, the code that even or if you don't want to, you don't have access to, to that software right now, um, the code is annotated in a way that is gonna be kind of a class on its own on what are the steps that you need to be able to measure each of these inputs if you were to do income accounting, okay? And, Ra and Raul will review uh, that with you on Monday. Okay, so without, uh, more details about this, though I'm happy to talk about them if the audience has questions. Let me just talk about how we measure output per work. So I'm gonna start with the output part of this, then I'm gonna talk about employment a little. Okay. Um, again, the good thing is that coming after Richard, Richard talked a lot about these things. So uh, you will see some repetition, but it's good to see it twice. Hopefully the second time is clearer. Um, Nomin and output, uh, is gonna um, typically from the national accounts, okay? But what we're interested in is in a measure of, of real outputs or a unit-free measure of, of uh, how much an economy produces, okay? And then the question is, okay, then that means if I have a nominal number I, I, and I wanna turn it real, what do I do? I divide by the, the, the price level, okay? Now, what is this price level? This was a concern, uh, um, it draws some, some discussion among economists and kind of the two candidates to do something like this are, okay, maybe I wanna denominate, say the GDP in Brazil in dollars and now it is directly comparable to the US GDP in dollars. Well, they, one way to do that is to just use the exchange rate of the real to, um, to the dollar and transform everything in dollar values, okay? Now, the problem is that the exchange rates are good measures of, um, of tradable goods, okay? And something that economists, um, uh, in particular, Vela Balassa and, and Samuelson figure out early on is that, well, there are departures from what is called purchasing power parity, okay? So let me, let me get a little bit into, into this. So the, per the PPP prices, and I'll tell you what they are in a second, are built from the International Comparison Program, okay? Um, which basically surveys goods that in theory should be of comparable quality across countries, okay? And they do a lot of effort to compare similar goods. But more important, they really want to have the same basket of goods priced in different countries, OK? What does this basket include? It includes consumption and investment good prices. It also includes tradable and non-tradable goods, so a haircut, OK, and an apple. But it doesn't necessarily include imports and exports. If you go to the documentation of Penworth tables, you're gonna see that after version 9.1, they have done a lot of effort in trying to have proper deflators for exports and imports, okay? The reason why when I do this income accounting exercise, I'm gonna be thinking of 
close economies, is that it turns out that that component of export and import from a pure accounting exercise, it's not, it's not important in explaining the large disparities in income across countries, okay? And there is a nice paper um, written by the uh, Penworth Table uh, you know, group discussing, the, discussing this issue, okay? Now, in general, the issue of comparing prices on poor and rich economies is a complicated matter. So what is the issue here? The issue is that the bundle of goods that people consume in India is systematically different from the bundle of goods that people consume in, um, in Peru, okay? Staple goods are different, right? You know, the diets of people change dramatically across countries that are even in the same income uh, bracket, okay? So, you know, if you wanna, if you're interested in the issue of comparing prices across countries, I think the, the paper by Eaton and Heston is a, is a good reference to think about this. Now, how does the, the PPP price, is, how is it constructed? Just so we have an idea of what is that we are actually doing when we deflate using um, PPP prices instead of exchange rate. So the, the, the basic idea is that if we use the exchange rate, we're only pricing goods that are tradable, okay? Whereas if you use the PPP prices, you are really comparing the same bundle of goods across countries. Why is that important? I'll tell you in the next slide, okay? Now, how do you construct these bundles, these bundles of these prices, sorry? What I want you to get from this, uh, from, from the procedure is that you're basically gonna have an aggregator, so the sum across countries, of a price of a consumption good. Suppose that all that there is in an economy are apples, okay? So you're gonna, you're gonna price apples uh, in different countries, that's PJ, sorry, let me just mark this. You're gonna price prices in different countries, that's PJC, okay? And then, um, you're gonna weight this, sorry, you're gonna turn these prices into a common unit, okay? Using an exchange rate, that's gonna be the PPP exchange rate. I'll get back to this in a second. But then you're gonna weigh these prices, the price of an apple in Bangladesh versus the price of an apple in Brazil uh, using the domestic consumption in country J of that apple relative to the world consumption of apples. Now, a direct implication of this is that because the weights have um, the size of the economies here, prices from rich countries are gonna have more weight than prices from poor countries, okay? That's first takeaway. Second takeaway is the following. This is what is called the Penn effect or the Valasa Samuelson effect. So this is what I did. I took, I took, you know, output in current dollars from the uh, are reported in Penworth table in a country. In this case, I picked Argentina, my country of origin, China, and Finland, a rich economy. Okay, and then I did two things. I could, deflect, I could turn this into common units using the exchange rate or using the PPP deflator. Okay? Now what you see is that in relatively poor countries like Argentina and China, GDP looks bigger when you deflate with PPP than when you deflate with exchange rates. Why is that? First, sorry, first of all, this difference seems small because I'm using a log, um, a log um, these are logs of output per worker. I should have changed the scale. I'm sorry for that, I'll, I'll do it. But basically the difference in this, in terms of um, uh, PPP dollars is about $5,000, okay? So for a country with an income per capita of about 20,000, which is Argentina, this is a big deal, okay? Now, why is that when I deflate with PPP, I get uh, that poor countries have, seem to have higher value add? 
Well, the Balasa Samuelson effect says the following. If I have an economy where the production, you are uh, relatively less productive in tradables, okay? What that's gonna generate is that the overall price level of the economy is gonna be cheaper. Not only of tradables, also of non-tradables. Okay, this is the idea that if, you know, if you want somebody to help you in your house in the US or in Europe, in terms of the income of the average guy out there in the street, it's gonna be pretty expensive, okay? It's gonna be a good chunk of your income. Whereas if you are in Turkey, in places in South America, you know, getting somebody to come and help in your house is gonna be relatively cheaper. You know, somebody helping in your house is highly non-tradable. So how is this possible? What does the Balasa Samuelson effect? It's the idea that even the prices of non-tradables are gonna be cheaper in poor countries because the price of trade, because they're relatively less efficient in producing tradables. So what that's gonna generate is that if you look at income disparities deflated using exchange rate, you're gonna overestimate the differences in income across countries, okay? So the idea is that poor countries are gonna look even poorer because you're not adjusting for the fact that the non-tradable goods actually are actually cheaper in those countries. All right, are there questions about this? All right, so if I wanna measure income per worker, now I need to go to the denominator. I need a measure of employment. Well, then I need to uh, take a call. I could just use headcounts or I can use hours work. Until Penguin Table um, 9.1, there were actually no harmonized measures of average uh, working hours available uh, within the Penguin Table. Even now in version 10, you're gonna see that there is available a measure of hours work, but the measure that is available there is not gonna be available, it's not gonna be available for all the countries in the sample and for the whole time period, okay? So a lot of the, you know, the two humble chapters that were uh, assigned as, re as, as reading material for this course still use measures of workers that are just headcounts, employment, okay? Now, why is this important? Well, there is a paper by Biggs, Fulshulden, and Lagakos that shows that our works decrease with development. So people in rich countries work less hours than people in poor countries. Why is this important? Because if in my accounting, I compute, remember the object here is output per, per worker. If I divide by a systematically um, um, lower level of employment in poor countries, then I'm gonna, then I'm gonna tend to increase the amount of output per work. But what happens is that the amount of hours work is higher in, in poor countries, okay? So what you have um, in the, what you have in this, in this, in the exercise that you have in the repository is you have the alternative to use either employment that maximizes the sample or to use employment times the average hours work, which is gonna give you a total number of hours uh, um, full-time equivalent workers uh, in an economy. Okay, so you can play around with the with the with the uh, data that way. Okay. Sorry, so, I wanted yeah. to ask something related with these working hours. Yeah. I was thinking when I was reading this paper in the recommendation mm -hmm. that um, is there any way to control for the actual hours work because I can't imagine that we have very long shifts like they have the example of Egypt with 57 hours I highly doubt that people you know like commit a big effort working for 60 hours a week I mean I don't know for me it's kind of odd and coming I mean I, I'm, I'm Spanish and here we have longer working shifts than for example France Germany and stuff like that but maybe we we relax a little bit during the working hours right because it's a longer shift. Yeah, so you're, uh, okay, if I get correctly uh, your, your question, what you're trying to, uh, or you're asking is, are all hours, uh, do all hours entail, entail equal effort? And if yeah. what I'm really after is a measure of employment, I agree with you. I don't think we have 
uh, even for developed countries, I don't think we have good measures of, of this. Okay. okay. Um, now, the fact that there are 57 hours in Egypt, I don't think it's very surprising in the sense yeah. that um, if you ever walk through Cairo, you will see that people barely sleep. So mm. uh, it's not so surprising that the hours are, are longer there. But I agree with you, there is an issue of, of uh, productivity assigned to this. And in part, that's going to be coming in, in the amount of output that you produce per hour work, right? Yes. So that will be the direct measure of, of that efficiency. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So, um, so, uh, in measuring the, the, the next thing that we need to measure is the capital output ratio. Okay. Now the current, so think about what is capital and economy. Capital and economy are production lines, the trucks, the cars, um, but also, you know, the, the land that you have available, the buildings. Now, Penguin Table considers the following categories. So they're gonna consider machineries, computer and communication equipment, transportation, structures, and other assets, in particular, IPP, which is intellectual property products and software. The reason why I'm highlighting computers and communication equipment and IPP and software is because these are equipments that particularly since the 2000s have had rapid changes in, uh, um, in the adoption of, of this type of uh, investment and the prices um, and are potentially important in the economy and at least in developed economies, in the economies that are coming up and are becoming available to us. If you go to the data set that uh, Richard also mentioned last week, uh, the total economy data set, there you're going to see that you have different time, ser time series for capital for what is called uh, communication equipment, ICP equipment, and uh, ICT equipment, sorry, and non communication equipment. Okay. So if you're interested in these particular capital goods, there is different disaggregations that are available in sister data sets to the Penguin team. Now, there is a question here of what is productive capacity versus uh, productive capital versus natural resources. So for example, countries uh, in, in the Middle East that mostly live out of oil rents are gonna look um, extremely rich because they produce a lot with a very little input. But it's not clear that the standard neoclassical uh, framework is what really, you know, a good theory to think about the output produced or the output, the, the richness of the workers producing in, in those economies. So Caselli and Feder wrote a paper where they're uh, taking this idea seriously, uh, trying to clean up uh, what is productive capital versus uh, natural resources. And a crude adjustment to uh, output that you can do is to just eliminate from output the rents that come from natural resources. The World Bank has put together a data set that is now available through the World Development Indicators that is going to allow you to know how much of your GDP are rents associated to these natural resources. So what you will see is what I did in the accounting that I'm going to present is I eliminate, I took away from the value of GDP the, uh, the rents from natural resources. Because if you don't do that, you're gonna have countries like you know, Qatar and Benin being super rich. They're basically living out of their, uh, their oil rents, okay? Uh, so how do you properly measure capital? Well, the standard way to measuring capital is the permanent inventory method, uh, which means that you're gonna use uh, the following law of motion. So suppose you have the stock of some equipment I, in this case, trucks, and you want to know how much stock you're going to have in each period of time. That's K. There was a typo in the notes, so I added a plus one on the, on the, uh, on the left-hand side here. I'll update it after the class so you have the link corrected, OK? So how much capital am I going to have tomorrow where I'm going to have whatever investment I have today plus the value of the undepreciated stock. Well, delta here is the depreciation rate for the stock, okay? 
Now, this is the stock of trunks. Then I need to aggregate. And to aggregate it, I'm going to use some weights to aggregate tracks to computers, to structures, to buildings. OK? Now, uh, a couple of issues. Let me first focus on, on the equation on top. OK? Now, what the, what the framework says is that delta should be physical depreciation. Now, the measures out there for physical depreciation typically include economic depreciation, which is this idea that you, know, you have your phone and your phone makes calls. Sometimes you know, it allows you to text. And if you have a, you know, a smartphone, then you are even able to connect to the internet. Fine, the services that you have are what they are. But you know, two years after you hold that phone, that phone, is worth half the price. It might be exactly the same phone, still making calls, still connecting to the internet. Why is that? Well, that's economic obsolescence. The reason why the price of that capital good falls is because there are better goods available in the economy, okay? Now, the second issue that is important to understand in measuring, in, in measuring capital stocks is that you need some sort of initial stock of capital to be able to generate this iteration, right? You see investment in each period, but you need to have some initial capital to use here. Okay, so there are two options. One option is to take uh, seriously a one sector growth model, here I call it a solo model, but a one sector growth model and say, okay, capital in the initial period is gonna be uh, investment adjusted by the depreciation rate of that capital, which for some reason, this is not working. Okay, the depreciation rate of that capital and the growth rate of the economy. All right, and that's gonna be my initial. The second approach that um, uh, people, in particular after Penworth Table 8 have been using is to uh, calibrate so that the measure of the stocks that you generate are consistent with the share of capital to, to output which happens to be, at least Finstra in 2015, this is a AR paper, uh, argues that this ratio is stable across countries and, and time. This is a different version of this is uh, uh, um, uh, the Caldor facts, okay? Now, the problem is when you go empirically and look at the data, it doesn't seem that this is so constant. So the newer version of Penworth table and here you have the link in the in the in the in the de slide deck, so you can see the increase in the uh, the change. Sorry, in this in this ratio. Um, so basically, what they are doing is they are trying to match countries given their income level to that curve that they estimate using the data from all these countries through time. Okay. Uh, sorry, that seems a little bit big, but that was the best I could do, given that I didn't want to spend more than, um, you know, five minutes talking about how you construct these ca this initial capital stocks. If you have questions about them, I'll be happy to answer at the end or offline. Okay. Okay. So the second issue is that now we figure out how to measure the stock of trucks. Now we need to somehow add tracks to computers. How do we do that? Well, we're gonna have some weighted averages of these stocks. Okay, there are various ways to do that. One way is to use the expenses in the, sorry, the stock of capital valued at whatever prices for the capital you have, divided the overall value of the capital stock in that economy at the point in time. The other way to do this is instead of using the prices of the capital is to use the rental prices, the rental rates. Why does this matter? Well, because the first approach is gonna tend to overstate the value of long lived assets. So the idea is that if I have a truck that can be around for 50 years and whose price is fairly stable through time and is giving me very little service in each period, then I'm gonna tend to overestimate the value of the truck and underestimate the value of the phone, right? Using these rental rates um, is perhaps a desirable, 
a, a better way to measure capital services associated to these long-lived assets. And the way they're gonna infer these rental rates is using the concept of the user cost of capital. So how do we do this? We wanna measure what is the user cost, what is the user cost of capital? Well, one way to do that is to do the following. So suppose I can, you know, I can buy a truck or I can put the money in the bank, okay? So suppose that the price of the truck is PI, PIT. If I put it in the bank, it's gonna give me a return RT. Or I can buy that truck, rent it, okay? And then I'm gonna end up with the undepreciated value of the truck, okay? Suppose it was, there was somewhere and there, and I can sell it back in the market at whatever price it's available for trucks tomorrow. I think we all understand that equation, right? So what this is saying is that if it is true that you are indifferent, when you buy this trunk, you're indifferent between putting the money in the bank and getting whatever return or whatever return you get when you purchase the, tr the trunk, then the user cost of capital can be inferred as a residual, okay? So basically the equation that you have here for the user cost of capital is just solving through for R, which is the user cost. Now, it turns out that after you do all this work, and again, you can play with this through the code that you have available in the repository, you're gonna see that the amount of capital services are not so different, okay? And this is just an empirical issue. I'll be happy to talk more about adjustment to the investment series, but I just don't have time to go through all this. It's already, you know, uh, hitting the limits. Now the next thing, so we have two more things that we need to measure. We measure output, we measure the capital output ratio, we need to measure the factor share for capital, and we need to measure human capital. Where are these factor shares estimated? Well, under the assumption of constant returns, you can literally uh, infer the capital share as a residual between the labor share uh, of income, so basically how much all the workers in this economy are paid for as a fraction of GDP, um, um, sorry, as a result of that, that, uh, that labor income over, over output. Now, the time series suggests that this number, that the capital share is about the third. And this is kind of, uh, um, um, color fox. Now, the cross-country data, when you go and do this with the, with the national accounts data, shows that there are massive differences, okay? What I'm gonna do for the exercise that you have in the code and what also Holland Jones and Jones in his chapter does is to just assume that alpha is one third. Now, uh, Doug Golin, uh, our steam Doug Golin, uh, who should be somewhere in the audience, uh, had an influ influential paper where he said, well, the issue is that you really need to consider self-employment. And in national accounts, typically self-employment is treated as capital income. So once you adjust for self-employment, which happens to be disproportionately more prevalent in poor countries, then you get an in, a labor share that varies between um, a third and 0.8. So the capital share is gonna go, sorry, two thirds and 0.8. And the capital share is gonna go between one third and 0.2. That's much smaller variation. The Penworth table has their own estimates, the new one, the Penworth Table 10, has the new estimates of the factor shares, but again, there is a lot of variation. So that's why I didn't use it. It's in the code, you have the code written, you can play around with it. Okay, finally, human capital. I'm gonna give you a brief overview of how we measure human capital. You're gonna have the full uh, supplemental lecture that Todd Schulman is gonna teach to get into the nitty gritty of, of how we measure human capital and how we do it properly and what is at the frontier. Now, the idea of measuring uh, um, human capital is basically uh, this idea that I think Juan had before that, you know, workers or an hour of a worker is not the same, neither through the day nor, you know, uh, of workers of different skills. So for example, a college educated worker 
uh, is going to have different input than an uneducated worker. Okay. Now the differences between those two workers are as what, what we're going to call efficiency units. So the idea that if my efficiency unit is one, it's basically that's a normalizing factor. Think that an uneducated worker uh, produces half of what an educated worker produces, then the efficiency units of the uneducated worker are going to be half of the other. And it's just a way to add um, uh, factors of production, in this case, human capital, in a way that take into account this heterogeneity that we know exists in the data. Now, the typical way to map this efficiency unit, to think about how a worker is different, is to say, well, the workers differ in the level of schooling and also in their experience in the, in the job, right? There are people that have been doing the same job for 30 years. It cannot be that they produce the same thing that the guy that just started the job, okay? Now, in, in a very nice paper, Bill Sanclino argued that there are also differences in kind of the quality, even if you have the same schooling and the same experience in Bangladesh and in France, it turns out that the quality of the input that you're putting in is different and that's gonna generate differences in return, okay? For what I'm gonna do today, I'm gonna assume that the quality of that, sc that uh, schooling is the same across, is identical across countries. And then we're gonna parameterize that function phi, which is gonna give me uh, the returns to, to, to schooling and, and experience as two terms. One that is just a function of schooling, the other one, that G that depends on my experience. Now, what is kind of the, the, the story of this specification? It goes back to the long labor literature that thinks about earnings in terms of a, a in Syrian regression, okay? The idea that the earnings that you earn are a function, are a function of your schooling, in this case, so in the mean cert specification, uh, an additional uh, year of schooling, so S uh, higher, is gonna give me theta more in terms of income. Um, and then the idea that experience also matters, it has a return, and it actually the return to experience is uh, convex, okay? Now, in this cross-country analysis, what we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna follow the Penworth table uh, for their own measures of human capital. So in particular, what they do, is they're gonna use the educational attainment data from Barrow and Lee, and also they are merging now uh, data from Cohen, Soto, and Lecker, that what, that, what it does is uh, it controls, it has better measures of what attainment means in a harmonized way across countries, okay? And then their, their returns are only gonna have returns to schooling or returns to education, and this is gonna come from uh, uh, Sakharopoulos 94, okay? Now, the human capital index that they're going to generate is going to have this uh, piecewise linear uh, shape that is going to say that the first four years of schooling is going to uh, increase, each year is going to increase your income by 13% uh, points. Then the next four to eight years is going to increase your income by 10%. And uh, sorry, this is a typo. This should be larger than eight. So if X is larger than eight, sorry, my handwriting is not best here. Let me just do this. So if S is larger than eight, then you're gonna get an additional income, uh, a marginal income of uh, 7%, okay? Now, as you see, the Penworth table right now is using a measure of human capital that doesn't depend on experience. Now, what, how important is experience? Well, there is a nice paper by Laga Cosmo, Porcio, Chian, and, and Todd Schwalman that argue that the experience profiles are steeper for workers with higher schooling, okay? But not only that, which is important for, for income per capita, is that the experience wage profiles are twice as steep in rich, in rich than in poor countries. So the idea is that the, you know, the return for, for, your, for staying one more year in the job is much higher in rich countries than in poor countries. So what that's gonna do is that it's gonna change the shape of your human capital input into that production technology. And I really encourage you to, to read the paper through, get to the need and greed. And I guess 
Todd will will uh, revisit some of these these issues next week. Juliet, I have another question. Uh, yeah. I was when I was checking this part as well. I was thinking like, um, I mean, yes, they they, they were saying that in uh, underdeveloped countries they have more experience on average, right? But I, I was worrying, and, and now you're mentioning that you actually have more return to experience in the in Western countries, in more developed countries. So um, I was wondering, like, this may be a problem related with um, job switching and um, probably sector switching. Maybe in underdeveloped countries, they don't really switch jobs that much. Because I, I, I don't know if you have any insight of this, because I don't know yes, if they so switch jobs more, sectors more. I don't, I don't have any idea. Um, Davian seems to be that there is more switching. But the events is very new. The paper to look into this is also a paper that uh, Scholman is writing with uh, Kevin Donovan. Um, if you just go through the web page, you're going to see, and the data is um, the data is available. There is another paper to look into this uh, by uh, Marcus Poschke, but I'm not sure if they have the uh, occupational turnover. So, so poor countries switch more. That uh, I think that's the I think that's the the takeaway. The problem is in the paper they're th really thinking about uh, unemployment employment flows. They are not uh, thinking about occupation uh, occupation I flows. I was thinking so, a little bit of might be some sort of friction, it, right? Like yeah. So the data I know these guys are thinking about these issues. I don't think we have a definitive answer. Not that I don't. Uh, not that I know. Maybe Joe or Doug um, um, will have a better answer about that. But I don't, don't think we know right now. Right. In part because it's very difficult to measure. So think about it. The real challenge in doing all these things is that you need to measure this stuff in a harmonized way across. Yeah. The and that's the, the, the harmonization. It's not because conceptually we think it's difficult. It's just because it's difficult to measure yeah. this in a harmonized way. Yeah. Okay. So with that, can I, can I let me just get to the that, results. Yeah. Uh, Jingong, do you have a question? Yeah, can I have a question about the price yes. adjustment? So yes. uh, earlier we talked about uh, using PBP to adjust the different prices in different countries. Yes. And um, for instance, if we select the US as a base country, we, we may want to convert all the other uh, uh, GDP into the US dollars. And this is uh, this is uh, important for doing a cross-sectional comparison. But what if we want to do a time series comparison? For, if we, for instance, want to compare the, the GDP of China over time and after converting uh, the same Y into USD, then which inflation, def uh, which deflator should we use, the US one? Well, there are or? different, the, the, I guess the answer depends on what is that you're, uh, what the, you're really interested in. Even when you do gross accounting, which is kind of the, the, the same exercise that I'm running here across countries, but for a country through time, you want to have a PPV measure of these things exactly because of the issues that I was discussing before. The exchange rates are just a measure of the prices of tradable goods, right? And we know that there are systematic different in a world where there was, sorry, and we know that there are systematic differences in the prices of non-tradable across countries and through time. So something that the newest version of the Penguin table does, so it used to be that they will use a benchmark here from the ICP, and they will use that to deflate the whole thing. The newest versions of the Penguin table, what they're doing is they're using different benchmark years to deflate different time periods, which is exactly what you want, because the bundles of goods are changing through time and across countries. So they make, they make sure to, to generate a deflator that takes the same bundle through time across countries, okay? So the answer, if you're gonna do a, a gross accounting exercise, is to use PPP. And the reasoning is what I was, what I was saying, is that we live in a world where uh, there are deviations for presence in power parity, and the reason for that is the Valasa samuelson effect. The idea that if you're less productive in the tradable good, your overall price level, also of the non-tradables, is gonna be lower. Okay, so there are systematic differences in the relative prices of haircuts to um, shoes. Okay, is there any more questions? Are there any more questions? Okay, so after all this work, uh, let's just try to see what we can find. So, how much variation in income per worker is accounted for variation in factors of production? And how much is just deficiency in using those factors or the, of the productivity? 
Well, what I did here is I literally replicated the table that is in John's 2016, the handbook chapter with the same countries with the only difference that I used the data in 2017 instead of the data in 2010. Also my natural adjustment, uh, my adjustment for natural resources is not what exactly what he did. Um, um, but, you know, in terms of the ranking of countries, what you're gonna see is that there was some reshuffling here on the top, but the ranking among poor countries is pretty much what he had there. Now, how do you interpret this thing? I'm gonna pick Argentina because that's the, the country I, I come from and it's rather arbitrary. I could have picked any, any other uh, one, but also because the numbers are easy, okay? So um, what we did here is we normalized the United States to one in each of the factors, okay? So what are the income differences between Argentina and the US? Well, one way to think about it is to do one over 0.4, let's give you approximately 2.5, okay? And now let's try to think of how much of this comes from measured inputs, which are the first two terms, and how much of that comes from the residual. This is what is produced in this uh, last column here. How do we measure that? Well, we know that what comes from TFP or the C is one over 0.5. That gives you a ratio of two, okay? So what is the 0.6 coming from? Well, we know that capital, there is basically no differences and there is about the um, uh, 0.2 differences in human capital, okay? So if you do, one plus two plus uh, one point two, you're gonna get um, yeah, you're gonna get about 0.6. Okay, which is the number that you have in the last call. And you do the same for each country. And then what I did is I produced the averages for the whole sample, not just the ones that are presented in this table. And then uh, I computed the same exercise. There you get to about 70%. Now, why is that? Well, what seems to happen is that if I, comp if I plot the share due to TFP, okay? The share of income disparities due to TFP, the last column that I showed you before on the y-axis against income per capita, income per worker, sorry, in the log axis, then what you're gonna see is that there is a strong negative relationship, okay? So what this is saying is that poor countries, sorry, that TFP explain more, most of the difference between those poor countries and the US than it does in rich countries, all right? That's takeaway number one. Takeaway number two, which you typically don't see in income accounting exercises, but I thought it was, I was just curious and I thought it was important to see, is that these effects are, I would say stable. Yes, there is a bit of a, of a trend in the contribution of TFP. I would say it's, it's stable, it's around 60%, okay? The contribution of, of TFP. There is a little bit of a trend and that's a question to, of measurement, et cetera, et cetera. So hopefully, you know, we'll figure, we'll figure that out soon. Now, another approach to thinking about the contribution, instead of doing that exercise that I, that I did before, is to think about a variance decomposition inspired measure. This is what Cassell in his handbook paper does, okay? Um, so you can take a, a factor only component of output per worker, okay? That's basically everything that we can measure. Capital output ratios, factor shares, human capital. And then you can have, uh, then you can write output per worker as this measure, which is what we don't know, you know, TFP, and then what we can, what we actually see. If you do a, a log variance decomposition of this, you're gonna see that the variance of log output is gonna be explained by the variance of um, the residual term plus the variance of the measure, the things that you can measure and the covariance between those two. Now, what is the income accounting exercise in this environment 
uh, translated to this model. Remember, what we're trying to answer is how much of the income variation is accounted for variation in factors of production. Well, this is uh, equivalent to asking what's the variation in output when, say, the productivity of all the countries is the same. But if the productivity of all the countries is the same, then the covariance between log Z and log uh, and what you can measure is going to be zero because Z is flat. Okay. Now, the key measure that Caselli proposed is to use a measure of success, basically, how much we can explain from measure stuff as uh, the variance in the log of uh, output measure versus the variance that we actually see in the data. Alternatively, you can follow the Clino Rodriguez Claret uh, approach, which is to say, no, while well, this covariance term is important, I'm going to assign it equally between TFP and uh, measured input. Now, if you do that, uh, the measure of success that you get is the following. So, in our data in 2017, you get that the variance of output per worker is about 0.65. The variance of output per worker that you can measure is uh, a third of that, sorry, 18%. So then what you can actually measure of the variance is about the third. Everything else, this is consistent with the number that we got from, from the other measure, about 70% on average is stuff that we cannot properly measure. Of course, I'm using a very, uh, you know, the way I measure capital and labor is as a standard as it can be. The papers that I mentioned through the whole data section um, increase the, the, the share accounted for things that you can actually measure, okay? So um, this, is, this is the plain vanilla accounting that you can, that you can run. Now, one more question, and, and with this, I likely close, I leave the selected issues for, for the discussion. I'll bring them up, uh, uh, I'll discuss them. If, if we want, because I really want to hear from you if you, if you have uh, questions and thoughts. So let me finish with, with the following. Um, so far, we have been thinking of an economy as a homogeneous unit, okay, where the production technology is what it is. But we know that there are sectorial disparities, right? The production in agriculture is not the same as, as in non-agriculture. Potentially, the production of tradables and non-tradables is different. Um, so I'm going to follow here the, the exercise that Caselli did, and I'll tell you why, why this is important. Uh, it's not arbitrary that we're picking agriculture and non-agriculture. So uh, you can think of total output in an economy as the, um, an employment-weighted um, average between the output produced by agriculture and the output produced everywhere else. Why is this important? Well, because pretty much all the workers in poor countries are employed by the agriculture sector, okay? And pretty much none of the uh, workers in the rich countries are employed in the agriculture sector. Now, the challenge for which we can not just have, you know, these aggregations for many, many sectors is that to be able to construct this, these measures of output at the sector level, you need PPP deflators by sector. And those are actually very hard to construct. For the case of agriculture, uh, Restucci, Yang, and Zhu uh, constructed measures using producer prices that came from uh, Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, okay? There is a, an early paper by Valley and Solo on the manufacturing and service, uh, service PPP using firm level data um, that I actually wasn't aware of uh, until uh, recently. And I think it's, you know, it's nice to, to take a look in, in terms of uh, giving us ideas on how to measure this, this PPP for broad sectors. Now, going back to agriculture. So how, so one way to think about this is to say, okay, how important is agriculture? We know that countries, rich and poor countries are very different in their employment shares. And they're also uh, potentially different in how much, this is a typo, sorry. This is a bar and this is a bar because this is a share outside agriculture and this is the output outside agriculture. All right, so how important this is? So the exercise that Caselli does is the following. 
he says, look, real output per worker, the, uh, the log variance for the period that he's using is 1.1. Suppose that, let me just rewrite the, the, the equation here. So output is the price in agriculture, the output in agriculture, and the labor share in agriculture. Oh, you have it here, sorry, I have it down there. Okay. So what happened if I put the output in agriculture that the US has, and I change nothing else? All that I do is I give the poor countries, uh, sorry, I give all the countries the output that the US has. Then the log variance in output per worker pretty much disappears, right? Alternatively, suppose I don't want to give them the technology of the US in agriculture, I give them the technology of the US in non-agriculture, this object. What do I get? Well, it drops by about half. So yes, it's important, but obviously not as important as difference in agriculture. What happens if I give them the employment shares of the US? Again, it decreases you know, uh, quite a bit, close to 70%. So these two components, the labor share in agriculture and the, um, the output in agriculture seems to be key drivers of income disparities across countries, okay? And that's why there has been a lot of um, research on this issue. Now, because I, sp I spoke too much, or maybe I, I, I was awfully, um, um, optimistic on how much I, could discuss, let me just uh, leave you with the following thought. So, you know, trade, trade economists tend to think of an economy between, you know, tradable and non-tradable goods. Growth economists think about consumption goods and investment goods, capital. And then the macro development economists think about, you know, agriculture, manufacturing, and services. But they, the big idea that I want to leave you with is that Relative prices in all these sectors, and hopefully you saw that from the measurement issues that we have discussing, right? We went from consumption to investment to tradable and to non-tradable to sectors. There is a lot of information about productivity that comes in relative prices, okay? So while this, the measurement of relative prices seems like an, a geeky issue, it's actually quite important because it has a lot of information about productivity difference, which are first order to understand income, per, uh, income disparity. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna just let you go and I'm gonna open the floor uh, in the last 10 minutes uh, for questions. Raul, do we have any, any questions from the chat? Hello, Julieta. Hello. Hello, yeah, um, thank you very much for the class. Okay, uh, I would just like to raise a point. Okay. If I may. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, according to findings, yeah, we 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 noticed that development accounting highlights human capital as an important factor of economic growth. And when we look into the literature, social capital is not a, a point which has been uh, really discussed. And however. Uh, we can see that there are some economic benefits of social capital. For example, but do you, uh, can you be a little bit more explicit? About what, I have an idea of what social capital means, but I just yeah. want to make sure that we, we are on the same page. What do you mean by social capital? Yeah, uh, maybe uh, some aspects like uh, confidence, integrity, like trust mm -hmm. among people. And yeah, uh, what I'd like to raise is that. Uh, we have uh, many uh, uh, some economic benefit of social capital, like people may find job uh, through uh, social networks, for example, and mm -hmm. trust encourages more efficient use of, of credit. And also um, social networks uh, are important for regional groupings of innovative activity sectors because uh, they, they can enable dissemination and sharing of knowledge, which are really important for economic growth too. 
So my question is, uh, what's your opinion about that? How can we take into account social capital? So uh, personally, I think that social capital may reinforce human capital and then uh, contribute to, to uh, economic growth. Thank you. Thanks. That's a very good question, Samson. So um, the answer comes into in two parts. The first one is that a lot of the features that we think about uh, in terms of social capital are actually, or say, you know, um, also the, the way you manage uh, your workers, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all going to be uh, in the accounting framework that I presented are going to be sucked into this uh, productivity term. Uh, how efficiently do you use the same input of production? The, the answer is in terms of that particular channel, I don't know what's the, in, the, in an accounting sense, I don't know what the, I don't know the, to pinpoint what the, the, the actual magnitude of that effect is. But what I would encourage you to think about is the fact that, uh, you know, the differences in, in what you will need is that the differences, there are dif systematic differences in social capital across, uh, across countries and across income. And that I'm, you know, I'm not a specialist in the field of social capital, but I'm not, I'm not sure if that is, that is true. And if anything, uh, if it will go in the right direction, right? Is social capital more valuable? Uh, likely social capital is more valuable in, in poor economies than it is in rich economies, but I'm really in the world of hypothesis sizing at this point, because I don't know what the actual answer to that is. So as I said, it's stuck in the Z effect. Uh, the real question is whether there are systematic differences in income uh, in terms of social capital. And I am not aware of uh, um, uh, research that documents this thing. There is a lot of research in terms of management practices, but that's a slightly different than what you're asking. Okay? Yeah, because, uh, yeah, yeah. Because uh, I, I can see that. Uh, when we talk about economic growth, uh, we, we, we may not see the, the direct effect, but when it comes to welfare, you know, uh, I really think that uh, social capital should not be put aside because it's not only a matter of what do you know, but it also yeah. involves uh, who do you really know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, so, Abulada, did you figure out your 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 speaker situation? Okay. Yes. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. My question is actually with respect to the concept of informality. Uh, do you think the TFP accounts for this? Yeah. So this is a, this is a, a nice uh, question. Some of that is accounted there. The real issue is whether we're measuring employment properly. Right. Okay. So the issue of informality is that you have a large, uh, and this is what what Doug Collins' paper is in about uh, is in part about. Uh, he uses uh, to measure properly uh, input shares, but you know self inform informality and self employment, at least in developing countries, go uh, very close together. Okay. And then the question is the measures of employment that are there are measures of formal employment. Uh, but, so potentially, but, there is room to, to think about uh, informality better. I know the Benbor table um, has been doing an effort to put informal workers, to measure informal workers uh, in a better way. But do you really share that view that was shared in the paper with respect to um, comparing self-employment and informality? I, I think there, there is a kind of difference between the two. No, there is a difference between the two. But what yeah. I'm saying is that a lot of the informal workers happen to be there are many of them that happen to be self-employed. That's all. That's on one side, but we, we see characteristically that in developing economies, uh, a huge ch chunk of transactions are done in the informal sector that are not accounted for. Uh, and, and it's kind of deliberate or also because- Oh, I see, there I see. Some... There, are, there are two issues. Okay, so there okay. are two issues. It's yeah. not only whether you count employment or not, there is also the issue that GDP whether GDP properly measures the informality. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. There is actually a nice paper by Paulina Restrepo Echevarria that takes this idea very seriously and tries to adjust measures of GDP by the size of the informal economy. 
And oh, I think my understanding okay. is that national, so to the extent that the informal economy is reflected in the national accounts, this is going to show up in, uh, in the pen work tables. The pen work tables are not going to produce new adjustment to the national accounts. One is my understanding is that in the developing world, there is uh, strong efforts to measure the informal sector in the value of, of output. Some of them, uh, you know, the, the measure of that success is yet to be seen. But I totally agree with you that, uh, you know, properly accounting for the size of the inco informal economy is actually quite important in understanding differences. In Could you please reference the paper? Because for me, that is very important. Because, yes, you know, so let me just take your name. I'll, uh, I'll follow up with you with a link to the, to the, to the paper. Oh, okay. Are there any more questions? Yeah, can I ask one more question? Yes. People are also asking about this paper. Who uh, was that? Some more people in the chat are also asking about the, the this paper. Okay. Then yeah. The, the the question about informality. Maybe you share it on the platform for. What I can do is I can share it uh, because I need to look for the link. So okay. what I can do is Perhaps I can. Monday. Uh, I can put it in my web page and I can ask Mandy to post it in the in the um, in the website. I can also put it in the repository where you have the rest of the material yeah. for the class. I think the that repository would be... will be nice. Yeah, thank you. All right. Okay, thank you. Andres, do you have a question? I believe I just posted a link to that paper in the chat. Ah, okay, oh, awesome. Hello. Thank you. I think it's the right one. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, thank you, Julieta. Um, so. I've been thinking, is there some way you can disentangle like allocative uh, efficiency with uh, technological efficiency? Um, may maybe by splitting in sectors or something like that. I get the impression that. Um, yeah, so if you, you know. notice, um, I think this is related to things that, you know, there is a whole course related to this, to this issue. And part of what the, the, the lectures that are coming up are gonna do is they're gonna, put you a different year of what we know in terms of allocative efficiency versus difference, differences in technology. So a lot of those issues are gonna be addressed in the, sec, in the module on misallocation, okay? I think uh, Richard and Pete Clino are gonna present okay, what our not, the state of knowledge is uh, in terms of how much of this is, uh, you know, differences in technology and how much of this is proper misallocation. I think your question is a good question in terms of something that I wanted to discuss, but I didn't have time to, which is this idea that, uh, you know, different countries may be choosing different technologies given the endowments and the frictions that they face, okay? And this is the idea in the paper by uh, Caselli and Coleman, uh, the world technology frontier, okay? There they're taking seriously skilled and unskilled workers and they're thinking about factor bias technical change. So basically the idea that technical change affects skilled workers differently than unskilled workers. But also this idea that, and I think what is uh, so impressive about, about that, the findings of that paper is that it seems just from a, an accounting sense that poor countries use unskilled workers better, quote unquote, productivity terms than rich countries. So that suggests that they're using different technologies. So it's not that they're in a vacuum. It's not that, oh, well, we're not adopting the technology um, and we're just worse, right? They're they are basically adapting the use of factors to the technologies that they can adopt. And they're adopting technologies that are complementary potentially to uh, the factors that they have available. The question is to what extent they're doing that um, in a constrained, efficient way, and uh, to what extent this is you know, misallocation of, of, of factors of, of production. But that there is going to be a whole module about that. So hopefully a lot of those questions will, will come back again then. Sue, do you have a question? Oh, hello, I have a very hello. question. Uh, uh, so I think in the accounting like equation that we have talked about, like, like assumes that there is so, so basically capital and labor are like separable. So there are no like inter like, like, uh, so any complementary relationship between them? Yes, yeah, so, so like, I, mm -hmm. Yeah, so would, would, like if there is like the like difference in the usage of like factors, then it, uh, what if, whether it might affect the, our income accounting or not, that, that was my question. 
Thank you, Sue. So this is another thing that I, I didn't have a chance to discuss uh, and it's part of my selected issues. There is a, uh, so there is, there is an issue on how we think about um, you know, measuring inputs and aggregating the efficiency of say, for example, workers or even capital, right? Capital of different vintages that are different. The way kind of the efficiency units or the standard approach to doing these things is to add them up linearly. And if anything, you know, compensate for the fact that say a high school worker is gonna produce slightly more than a, uh, uh, an uneducated worker. And the way we infer those differences in production is by looking at wage differentials. Okay. Now there is a nice exchange between uh, Ben Jones. It's all referenced in the slides. Ben Jones, uh, Caselli, and Ciccone, and then Ben Jones again. That literally get engaged into this discussion of you know what happened in a world where skill and and skill and unskilled workers are complementary, for example, right? And Ben Jones says, well, if you do that, then the role of human capital is going to be much larger. But then, you know, Caselli and Ticone said, well, wait, wait, you need to be careful because then one needs to really think that whatever differences in wages that we see between uh, skilled and unskilled workers are not at all connected to differences in technology. Because if they are, part of that is really differences in, you know, in TFP. And then at that point, the role of human capital can be as little as you want and as big as you want. And then there is a nice response from, from Ben Jones to, to this discussion that I think is worth for, for the students here to, to read, um, kind of saying, okay, yes, we can concede on, 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 on this front, but let's think really about how to do accounting in a world where there are all these complementarities in factor of production. So I think everything is there to be, to be written. The one thing that I wanna mention is that once you go into the world where all these inputs are not perfect substitutes in production. These simple accounting uh, tools that I have brought up cannot really be used really off the shelf. And I think an mo even more important question is, what's the elasticity of substitution between these factors? Okay, even if you're gonna go that way. I, you know, there is an active discussion in developed economies, in particular in the US, as of what those elasticities are. Um, so I think, you know, there, there are a lot of open questions. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know the answer, but I think, yes, this is a feature of the data that is potentially important. It's also important uh, in terms of what Andres was asking of, you know, the choice of technology given a constraint set. So, you know, I'll, I'll look forward to the papers that will come up on this. I'm sorry, but I have to, to uh, cut off the conversation. Again, uh, there will be the um, TA session for Monday. Uh, we want to thank uh, Julieta. Um, it was a very big crowd. Uh, people are dropping off now, of course. But um, uh, one thing for students to know is that basically everybody who's teaching here is doing this out of the generosity of their, their hearts. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Mandy and Kirsty one more time. Uh, next week, we will have on, on Thursday, Todd Shulman will be discussing more about human capital. Uh, so some, any questions about human capital, you can bring those to next week. And uh, that'll be Thursday. And then on Friday, uh, same time, will be uh, Bertolt Herrendorf talking about structural transformation. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. It's really uh, fantastic. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Joel.